So, all right. Uh, hopefully that motivated a little bit as to why uh, we need to think about the network and what you think about the what you should think about the network when you're optimizing for it. Some specific tips. Well, I, I could stand here for, for hours uh, because I've been working on this a book for the last year with O'Reilly uh, called High Performance Browser Networking, which is exactly, well, it's everything that we've talked about here except much more in depth and with some tips for how to, like, what do you actually do to optimize TCP on your server? Uh, turns out there's very simple things you can do to make uh, the experience faster for your users. And for TCP specifically, it's actually just like upgrade your server. That's the best thing you can do. Uh, if you have to run on a uh, secure connection or use TLS, there's a lot of things you can, uh, you can do or vice versa. You can hurt yourself if you don't do it right. Uh, wireless networks, HTTP1 and HTTP2. And we'll talk about those in a second. So, so some examples. Uh, we covered a little bit about uh, how the, the radio network works or how the wireless networks work. Uh, but there are specific techniques that you can use uh, in this context for things like uh, to improve the performance of your applications. Um, one example is uh, so battery life optimization. How do we optimize for the battery life? Well, it turns out on, on mobile networks, uh, you actually want to use techniques like data bursting and prefetching, which is to say, you know, you, let's say you're loading an app which has uh, a list of articles. Right, and uh, thumbnails with each article. Instead of saying, like, oh, I'm going to load the previews progressively as you scroll, that's actually an anti pattern on mobile. It's, it's both costly in terms of latency, because every single time you have to do that, you have to wake up the radio, you're going to incur this control plane latency cost and other costs, uh, but also it's very inefficient for the battery power, because recall that uh, the radio is the second most expensive component uh, on your phone. So what you want to do is actually prefetch everything up front or as much as, 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 me, as is meaningful for your application and then hopefully turn off the radio and not touch it ever again. All right, that's the ideal case. Um, things like periodic transfers. So beacons uh, turns out to be, this is a, a huge, huge problem. So a great case study that was published between AT&T and Pandora. So Pandora is a music app, right? You, you click on a song, it downloads the entire song and starts playing it. And uh, it's not streaming the music. It's downloading the entire song, which is exactly what you wanted, right? Because on a, on a 3G network or a 4G network, having your radio stay on while you download the song is very expensive. So, so far, so good. Except that the Pandora app would then send an analytics beacon in about every 60 seconds, basically just reporting like, hey, did you like the song? How far along did you listen? Did you rewind? And, you know, wh whatever other metadata. They ran the analysis, and they discovered that that beacon was contributing 0.2% of the bytes of the total transfer, but it was consuming 48% of the battery, right? So simply by moving that beacon into like a later phase, they, they, there's, it wasn't critical, right? They could defer it until later and say, like, I'm going to send this data when I request the next song, uh, which means I, I batch these requests, and it's no longer an issue. So they made their app a lot more efficient by just removing these things. For the web, things like you know, real-time beacons for real-time analytics, Awesome anti-pattern, right? You come to CNN.com, uh, you start reading that great whatever news story, your radio is waking up every five seconds today, uh, sending a beacon saying, like, I'm still here, I'm still here. I'm sure there's a beautiful you know, vanity dashboard somewhere at CNN that says, like, we got a bazillion users on our site right now. In the meantime, they're draining the battery of all of our collective devices uh, pretty fast, right? So uh, simple things that we can do to fix uh, this kind of thing. Uh, performance problems. For TCP and TLS, right, uh, my quick tip here is you know, we can talk in depth as to what you can do, but basically if you just upgrade your kernels on your servers, uh, you're going to get a lot of wins just right off the bat. Um, and in fact, most of the things that I'm listing, he uh, listing here are taken uh, care of. If you can't upgrade, then you know, we can talk more in detail later if you want to ask. Uh, TLS is a very complicated and interesting topic. Uh, depending on where you stand. It's either complicated or interesting. Uh, you know, some tips here. You know, some of these things may mean a lot uh, to use, some not. Uh, if, you, if you want to talk about TLS optimization, I'm happy to chat afterwards, but that's definitely a deep dive. Um, HTTP. It turns out that HTTP has a number of problems in itself, right? So HTTP was created uh, in a world where we weren't building apps like today. Like, we, we were building pages, right? It was a document. You fetch one document, you terminate the connection. That was the original model. Except today, a, a page, 
a page or an application is 80 is composed of 80 resources. Uh, so there are inefficiencies in the protocol. Things like concatenating files, spreading. How many of you like spreading images? Like spreading images? You guys got to be kidding me. Uh, so spreading images is a hack, right? It's an unfortunate hack that we have to do because HTTP can't deliver the performance that we want. I mean, that, that is... That, that is the reason we have to do it. Uh, we can't, small transfers are very expensive with HTTP and TCP today, which is why we're just saying, like, look, I'll just put it all into one nice bundle, one nice file, and that'll make stuff go faster. And indeed, it does go, make stuff go faster, but it's, it's painful. Uh, same things like concatenating files, right? Concatenating CSS and JavaScript files. It's the best practice that we have because of the limitations of the HTTP protocol. And it, they, these best practices actually have uh, negative consequences as well. So, for example, for uh, sprites, if you have very large sprites, right, they also occupy a lot of memory on mobile devices or on any device uh, when we decode the image because we have to decode the entire image. We can't just say, like, oh, let me fetch this, you know, 16 by 16 pixel region out of your 1,000 by 2,000 grid of icons. Uh, that doesn't work. Uh, same thing for uh, JavaScript and CSS. For example, for JavaScript, it's not uncommon today to find files that are over one megabyte in size, right, once they're concatenated. I mean, these are, these are large applications that we're talking about. And the problem with that is uh, JavaScript is not parsed incrementally, right? We have to wait for the entire file to be fetched, and only then can we execute it which actually adds a lot of latency. So if you just split that same file into, let's say, 10 chunks, we can execute it progressively, like in, in small little increments, and give you a better uh, experience. So uh, for example, on Gmail today, right, when you uh, type in gmail.com and you get that loading bar, that's exactly what it's doing. It's downloading a lot of JavaScript, but it's downloading it in chunks and saying, like, OK, I'm going to execute this, I'm going to execute this next part, and the rest. So we can give you some visual feedback and also accelerate the loading progress. I mean, it's an unfortunate thing that we have to do this, but it, that's, that's how it works. Uh, so we have this new uh, exciting uh, project, which is HTTP2, right? So it's, it's being standardized by ETF right now. And uh, the great news, or the best news about HTTP2 is that it'll allow, allow us to undo many of the hacks that we've had to apply on all of our applications. So now that all of you guys have sharded all of your assets, concatenated all of your files, and sprited all of your images, yeah, undo all of that, right? Uh, well, it's, it's actually more complicated than that, and we'll talk about it in a second, because uh, HTTP2 Two also won't happen overnight, right? Like we will have clients that will be stuck on one X. So how do we kind of go between the two worlds? Uh, because you don't want to hurt your one X users because they're probably the ones in a slower connection to begin with uh, versus two X. So it's a it's a complicated topic uh, and an interesting one too. And then finally, the application. So all the stuff that I'm talking through here is, is covered uh, in the book. And by the way, it's, so it's free, it's online, you can read it, and please actually comment on it. Uh, it's still in the early draft. Uh, then there's things like XML HTTP requests. Like, how do we? We've we've been abusing XML HTTP requests for a lot of things, like real-time streaming and, and all the rest. Uh, that it just it wasn't designed for that sort of thing. So we have new and better APIs in the browser. Things like server sent events, WebSocket, and even WebRTC. So WebRTC is actually bringing UDP in the browser. Uh, something that I thought would never happen, but it's here. Um, it's available in Chrome, it's available in Firefox, and you can have peer-to-peer -peer communication between multiple browsers, which is amazing. So network is the foundation of your performance strategy. Uh, it's very important to get it right. Um, you know, as a, depending on where you sit, you know, a designer, a web developer, or a server guy, uh, you, we need to have a mutual understanding of like, how does the stack actually work? What are the, uh, the constraints? Uh, that are imposed by the network. And based on that, we can actually start designing uh, smart um, applications. So I mentioned HTTP2. Uh, let's, let's talk a little bit about, I'm not going to go in depth on HTTP2, but I just want to highlight a few things. Like what, what's, what's new about HTTP2? And you know, 2 sounds like a big thing. Like are we going to replace all the angle brackets and you know, demand that you use curvy brackets all of a sudden? Uh, no. So. HTTP2 does not replace HTTP. In fact, it's, it's just a, it's a simple extension. So the reason for the 2.0 is that we're redefining how the data gets transported on the wire. As far as your application is concerned, nothing has changed, right? Like your XML HTTP request code looks identical. Nothing has changed from that perspective. But how the data is shuttled between the client and server is different, which is why we need the 2.0, because they're basically backwards incompatible. So the, re the way this works is uh, we've had, 
IP, we have TCP, we talked about all these, and then we have HTTP sitting on top, and the new component is this binary framing layer. And uh, the idea behind the binary framing layer is that we want to be able to split uh, messages, HTTP messages, uh, and deliver them across the same connection. So right now, if you want to transfer two resources at the same time with HTTP, we need to open two HTTP connections. Right, and we need to transfer both files in parallel, to transfer both files in parallel. With HTTP2, we can actually do that over one single connection, because we basically take one entire message and we kind of subdivide it into little parcels and say, like, you know, here's this chunk belongs to this, this stream, this chunk belongs to this other stream, and then we can just uh, multiplex them over the same connection, which actually gives us much better TCP performance and better throughput, lower latency, and a whole host of other things. And it also undoes all of these hacks that we have to do for things like... Uh, concatenating files, right? Because uh, there is no, uh, there's no overhead with s making small requests anymore. You can send me 100 small requests, and I'll just send them all in parallel over one TCP connection. We don't need to open 100 TCP connections. One really cool feature of HTTP2 is HTTP server push. So the idea here is that, hey, I've just sent you a request for your index.html file, right? You know what's what's inside of the index.html file. Like there's a, a logo icon and a CSS style sheet and other things. So instead of me getting that data back and then parsing it and saying, oh, by the way, also give me the style sheet and these other things, what if the server could actually, you send me the index request and I could push you all of this, all of these resources at once and say like, look, you're gonna need the HTML, but you're also gonna need, you're gonna need the JavaScript and the CSS and these five images, right? Uh, this eliminates the extra round trips, which of course helps us reduce latency. And uh, one thing to note here is that this is not an application API. Like, this is, this is not a JavaScript thing that you script to say, like, oh, give me a callback when a server pushes a resource. This is a completely different mechanism. So this is lower level. And in fact, you know, this, this sounds kind of crazy the first time people hear it. Server, we already have server push. Uh, it's called inlining, right? So how does inlining work? We're saying, look, I know you're going to need this like icon file or this JavaScript file, right? You're going to ask me for it, and it's expensive for you to do so because it's a very small file. We're going to incur the extra latency. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to place this resource right into this file, right? Like base64 encode an image into the file, and I'm going to push it to you as part of the page. That is push, right? You're basically saying I'm inlining this resource for you. So push does the same thing, except it doesn't make the resource be part of the page, right? So the problem with inlining is that let's say you have a logo icon that you want to inline across all of your pages. Well, the bad news is it's now part of every single page, right? It's if let's say that was 10 kilobytes or five kilobytes. Now you've inflated the size of each and every page by five kilobytes. With push, you can actually push that one resource and say, by the way, this is the logo.png or what have you, and put it in your cache. Right, so uh, this is really, really cool, and I think we're going to see a lot of exciting stuff um, coming out of this. This requires server support, but uh, it'll be great once we have it. So how do we use HTTP today? 2.0 today? Well, the short answer is the spec is still in the process of being written, so it's not yet ready, uh, but we do have Speedy. So Speedy was a precursor, if you will, to HTTP 2. Um, it is it's still available, and basically we treat Speedy as an experimental version of HTTP 2, right? Uh, this is where it's a test bed where we test new ideas, we experiment with them, and then we kind of move them in it into the official HTTP 2 spec. So today, Speedy is actually supported by Chrome, uh, and Chrome supports it on iOS, Android, across all the different platforms, Firefox, and Opera. So this is well over half of the browser market uh, that supports Speedy, and you can actually use it today. There's uh, modules for things like Apache, Nginx, uh, Node, and, and other things, right? So basically any popular server today uh, has uh, ability or capability in libraries to talk Speedy. And the great thing about uh, Speedy is, for example, take Apache, let's say your site is running on Apache, you literally add a module on your server, and then the rest is taken care of, right? So you don't really need to do anything to modify your application. From there, of course, you should modify your application to remove things like domain sharding and all the rest, because those things will actually hurt your performance with HTTP2, uh, but that's a separate story. And, um, you know, of course, at Google, we've been offering Speedy for, you know, if you use Chrome today, you're using Speedy. Uh, if you, sorry, if you're using Chrome today and you're using Google services, you're using Speedy, right? Because a lot of our services run on SSL and we use Speedy there. Twitter, WordPress, Facebook, uh, they're all deploying uh, Speedy as well to the users. So, you know, we, we see good uh, latency and performance wins there. 
So some common questions that I get about HTTP2, uh, you know, do I need to modify my sites? No, you don't, right? We already said that. Uh, but you can optimize your sites uh, for them. How do you, what is the best optimization? Uh, the first one that you should start with is on shard. Like, so if, you, if you're currently splitting your resources across many different domains, you want to undo that. Or you want to have logic that is able to automatically figure out whether that should be applied for speedy connection or non-speedy connection. Uh, because sharding the connection will basically forces multiple TCP connections, which negates a lot of the performance benefits of HTTP2. Um, server optimizations, we kind of talked about this already. So a lot of TCP tuning that you need to get right to have the performance uh, Good performance for HTTP2. And finally, you know, this, is, this sounds all complicated. It doesn't have to be. Uh, you can install uh, simple modules, uh, and you know, you'll have this uh, capability right in your server. Uh, a cool little tip is that if you're, if you're running on Google App Engine today, if you just enable SSL on your application, you'll automatically get speedy, right? And you don't have to modify your app. So that's kind of a, a cool feature there. OK, so finally, uh, let's talk about measurement. Uh, it's important that we understand how the network works, what are the limitations, but you know, is what's the problem to begin with? Like, should I be optimizing my TCP stack, or should be should I be profiling my JavaScript code to begin with? Right? Like, every single application has a different bottleneck, so it's important that we have good tools to figure out uh, where the problem is. So, there's a great spec uh, that is supported across most of mo modern browsers today uh, called navigation timing. How many of you guys have used navigation timing or familiar with it? Wow, just a few hands. Okay, great. So uh, navigation timing looks scary, right? This is kind of a scary diagram here. But basically what it's showing you here is the full life cycle of the page. So anything, and we covered all of this already, right? So a DNS lookup, a TCP connection, sending the request, how much time it took to get the response. And each one of these labels uh, is actually a timestamp that is provided by the browser that gives you low-level access for each one of these stages. So at a very high level, right, you can think of it as kind of three clusters. One is user's connectivity. So depending on whether I'm on a Wi-Fi connection or a 3G connection, uh, the time, for example, to do the DNS lookup will vary quite a bit. Uh, then there's a server response time. So you can actually figure that out based on this data. And then there is a in the browser execution time, which is how much time it took to load JavaScript and uh, all the rest. So the way to get at this data uh, is to actually just pop up your console, whether that's uh, Firefox or Chrome, and you can just type in performance.timing, and you get this JavaScript object back, uh, which has a lot of these timestamps right here. So each one of these uh, examples here is, is uh, that same label that we saw in the previous diagram. And you, know, you can tell that we're serious about performance because each one of those timestamps is in microsecond, not millisecond, but microsecond uh, granularity. So what do you do with this data? Well, this is available on each and every page load. So, th And the important part here is this is running in your browser. right? Mm -hmm. So what does this mean? The user comes to your site. The performance.timing object reflects their experience of your site, so their DNS lookup time, their TCP connection time. This is not a synthetic test where you're saying, look, I'm going to have a couple of servers um, in North America, in Asia, and somewhere else kind of ping my site and figure out how well it's responding. You're gathering data from real users on real networks here, which is the, the real uh, advantage here. So once you have this data, right, you can just grab it and beacon it back. So if you have an analytics server that you're using, you can just report it to yourself and aggregate it. Uh, if you're using something like Google Analytics, we already collect this data for you. So uh, if you have it installed on your site, uh, then you're already gathering this data. And if you just go into your dashboard and you go to the site speed report, you'll actually see uh, some performance data on your site. The one tip that I'll give you is that by default, Google Analytics will only, will only sample 1% of your visitors. Right? So this is the, just the default number. Uh, and we also have a limit of, I think, up to 10,000 samples per day. So for example, on my site, you know, it's not a very high traffic site. I just set the sample rate. I manually overwrite the sample rate to say, you know what, just gather the performance data from every single user because I want to have a really good sample of data. Right? I only have a couple of thousand visitors per day. So for me, it doesn't matter. So if you go into your site speed reports and you're seeing not a lot of data, uh, just update this one variable in your configuration, and you should be good to go. 
And then you get something like this, which is you log into Google Analytics and you get a report that says, hey, you know, there's been 6,000 page views and the average page load time is about 10 seconds. And I'm sad to say that's actually my own site. So maybe I shouldn't be on stage talking about this stuff. <laughs> but actually, the, this illustrates a good point, which is uh, the 9.7 uh, seconds is actually very, it's a skewed number. Because you can see here that there, for some reason there was a 60 second page load time here. Uh, not a good experience, right? And the average is getting skewed by this uh, by the sample. So what I can do then is I can go into Google Analytics or any you know any analytics solution that you're using. This is just an example. You can start segmenting the data, right? So you have the user's IP address, you have maybe your application data like a user ID or other things, and you can start uh, going deeper and say like, well. Was it the case that everybody uh, was experiencing 60 second page load time, or was it a specific, maybe geographic region, right? So in, in this example, I'm actually segmenting all of my traffic by uh, geography. So I'm saying, look, I want to look at Singapore, San Francisco, and Japan, right? And it turns out that it was Singapore specifically. Like there was users coming from Singapore had just couldn't load my page. Like they were stuck there spinning for 60 seconds. Actually, later I tracked this down to one of the social widgets that I had on my page, which just wasn't loading in Singapore, and it blocked the render of the page on my site. So, you know, problem fixed afterwards. Uh, but, you know, it, this, isn't, this didn't affect everybody. And Frankly, I would have never discovered this unless I actually gathered this data from real users, right? Because if I had just a, server, a synthetic server ping my, ping my site from London and New York, I would never caught this. And then finally, uh, I guess a really important point to make here is that averages for performance data are misleading. If, you, if you're tracking average response time, average latency, and other things, uh, that is the wrong metric to use for performance data. What you want to use is something like a mean, or, or sorry, a median, um, and, and even better, look at the actual distribution. For example, you know, here, here's kind of a silly example, but here's a long tail distribution. What is the mean value of this distribution, right? It's somewhere right here. Uh, but that's kind of a meaningless number. And let me show you this uh, as an example. So in the same Google Analytics reports, uh, we also give you the actual histograms of the response time. So for example, in this case, I'm showing you what is the page load time, right, split by buckets. like. How many people have finished loading all the page, the page in less than one second, in one to three seconds, three to se seven seconds, and so on, right? So you, you kind of get this hump here, and then there's a long tail. And uh, on the right uh, is a comparison where I've actually upgraded my site, I made it faster, and you can see that the whole distribution kind of shifted upwards, right? Which is exactly what you want to see. More users are loading the pages faster, but there are still outliers, right? For, some, for whatever reason, there's still... 4% of users that are experiencing 60, se 60 second plus page load times. I'm not sure why, right? I need to track that down. And here's a really good example of why averages are so misleading. So this is a, a different metric. This is for server response time, right? And look at this number here. So on my site, I was running a WordPress blog, and I had caching enabled, you know, as any good WordPress site should. And most of the time, right, so for 40% uh, of the time, uh, the pages would load really fast. But then for whatever reason, a lot of the pages, there's a second hump here, which is uh, some pages would take one to two seconds to load. And the reason for this is because some of the, uh, some of the posts were in cache, so I was able to serve them very quickly. But then whenever I missed the cache and I had to go to the database and render out the whole thing, it would take one to two seconds, right? So you look at this distribution and you say, what is the average? Well, I'm, I'm going to say that the average is pretty much meaningless here, right? Because what's actually happening here is there's two completely different distributions of users. There's the fast users, which are experiencing the, the cash load times, and then there's the slow users. And in this case, there's a lot of slow users, over 30%, 40% of the users, right? And then I, once again, I upgraded my server, made everything much faster, and now, uh, let's see, 90, over 90%, is that right? Yes, over 90% of all the users are getting their pages loaded in uh, less than... 500 milliseconds, all right? So this is why you want to look at histogram data for all of your performance metrics. So measure your user-perceived network latency with navigation timing. If you have not, uh, there's, 
if you have not already. Uh, if you don't have an analytics solution that can deliver this today, there's a number of them available. Of course, I, I mentioned Google Analytics, but there's a lot of third-party solutions that you can install on your site as well, specifically for Google or specifically for collecting ROM data. But of course, I find that the real power of having the uh, performance data is that you can then segmented and intersected with other metrics in your current analytic solutions. Things like, uh, what user type is this, right? Like, are, are they on a tablet? Are they, which geography they're coming from? And you can also, if you also have your revenue data, let's say you're selling widgets on your site, right? You can actually say, what is the revenue per user for users that are experiencing a five second page load time? Right? And you can compare those segments, and you can look at them side by side, and, and you know, I think most of the time you'll find that there's going to be a big negative number uh, associated with a five-second plus uh, audience. So that's also a great way to motivate uh, your company to say, like, we need to invest into performance, right? Because I can, I can be here on stage and, like, raw, raw performance, but if you can't connect it to the bottom line, and why does that actually matter for my organization? Eh, you know what? We've got a lot of other things to worry about. I need to build that new whiz-bang future, right? Uh, that supposedly all the users want. So use advanced segmentation, uh, set up weekly reports. You know, I just have Google Analytics email me a report every Monday, actually, so I'll get one. I got one yesterday, uh, which just says, like, here's what happened last week, right? And I can look at that histogram and say, okay, there's some outlier in you know, this specific region. Uh, I can look into that. Or for some reason, my latency is spiking. So let me pause uh, here for one second. Uh, you know, we talked, we covered a lot of stuff about the network. Do you guys have any questions before we go any further? Yep. Uh, so the question is, like, if you want to implement Speedy and you have an Apache server, and then in front of the Apache server, you have an Nginx server, right? How does that actually work? <coughs> so that, that's a hard question. Both Apache and Nginx support Speedy, but one, only one of them can terminate the TLS connections. First of all, practically speaking, today, you need a secure connection, a TLS connection, to run Speedy for uh, reliability reasons, because there's a lot of intermediaries, <coughs> things like caches on the web, which Jeez. <coughs> Sorry, I'm losing my voice here. Um, which don't understand Speedy, and they, they may fail the connection. So part one, we need SSL, right? Then once you have SSL, you can have, for example, Nginx terminated. Oh, my goodness. <coughs> um, and once uh, the connection is uh, terminated, Nginx will actually transform uh, HTTP2 requests in, into HTTP1. So it will send the, re the regular HTTP1 request to your Apache server. So your Apache server doesn't need to be aware of uh, HTTP2. So that's probably the simplest way to do it. The other way to do it would be to actually just put Nginx into a dumb TCP router. But that's probably not what you want to do. Right. Yep. So what you want to do is you want to terminate the TLS connection at Nginx, and Nginx will be smart enough to convert the HTTP request into HTTP 1 and send them to your Apache server or any other server. So if you have a Java backend, a Ruby backend, or a Node backend, and it understands and speaks HTTP, it'll just accept that request, send the response back to the Nginx, and it'll re-encode it into HTTP 2. Thank you. Yeah, so that, that's probably the simplest way to get started. Any other? So how will HTTP2 affect mo uh, mobile battery life? Um, hopefully, it'll make it better. Uh, so one of the problems today with a lot of HTTP connections, for example, is uh, closing those connections. So oftentimes, what happens is you fetch a resource, like an image file from uh, your CDN, right? Your phone goes to sleep. It turns off the radio. And then 15 seconds later, that connection needs to be terminated. So we wake up the radio just to send the fin packet, right? Like one bit of data saying, like, I'm going to close this connection. And that drains the battery. By having one connection, uh, we can actually both deliver better throughput, but we also don't have to close the con as many connections. So it actually it works out to be better, I think, in the long run. No, no, OK. So this is a great point. Um, 
just the fact that you have an open TCP connection does not mean that you need to keep your radio on. This is a very important point. So what happens is, uh, let's say you have your router at home. Like, let's take a simple example, right? Your router is the one that terminates the connection when it comes in from the web, right? And then your router forwards the packets to your laptop, right? Similarly, in a wireless network or mobile network, the network will terminate the TCP connection, and it keeps that connection open, right? Then the, re the radio, the tower can tell you, hey, turn off your radio because there's no packets coming to you at this, at this very moment. And then if a packet, new packet comes in, I'll tell you to wake up and you can resume the connection. So the physical connectivity is not correlated to TCP connectivity. Right? And this is, a, uh, this is a great point, actually, because uh, very frequently I find frameworks, uh, you know, JavaScript frameworks and other things, which have specific uh, code that says, like, set interval one second or whatever, right? And, like, just ping the server because I want to keep the connection open because otherwise, you know, bad things will happen. It's like, no, 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 you don't need to do that, right? The, the radio network will take care of that for you. Your phone is smart enough to wake up uh, when it needs to without terminating the speed connection. Hey, um, how does HTTP 2 or Speedy compare with HTTP 1.1 with Keep Alives? So how, how does HTTP 2 or Speedy compare with HTTP 1 Keep Alives? In regard to like number of open sessions and... Right, so with HTTP 1, uh, most browsers have a limit of six connections, right? And ideally all those connections are long-lived connections because you want to grow your bandwidth and all the rest. Uh, that... So that, that's keep alive at work, right? With previous versions of HTTP, for, you needed a new connection for every single request. Like you send me a request for an image, I terminate the connection, and then you restart. Keep alive allows us to reuse that connection. Um, HTTP 2 is much more efficient in that it also allows us to send multiple requests in parallel. Right? So these are independent things. Uh, we, H, like HTTP 1 keep alive just means that, you, let's say you only had one connection with HTTP 1. This is how it would work. And you want to send me five requests. With HTTP 1, you send a request, and you wait until I give you the response back. You give me the full response, I send you the next request. So it's, it's serialized, right? And that's not good for latency, for obvious reasons. With HTTP 2, we can say, one connection, here's all five requests. Server, you determine what is the best way to s send me all the data back. Right, so for example, maybe you want to send me the HTML data back quicker than the image bits because you know, it, it's more meaningful for me to start constructing the page than to start display. I can't display images until I have the HTML. Right, so these two things are uh, independent. Uh, with Speedy or HTTP2, uh, do you have to configure all the resources for a page or does it parse the HTML and read the resources? Are you referring to server push? Yeah, so server push uh, is a really interesting area that still needs a lot of research. So if you look at the actual specification, the way it's written, it says nothing about how, like, it says push is possible, but it doesn't give you any algorithm for determining how the push should be made. So uh, this is something that servers or your applications can innovate on top of, right? Like, this is just a basic building block. As an example, uh, the Jetty server, uh, those guys have implemented a cool algorithm where uh, the server looks at the request. So you, you send me the index HTML request, right? In, within the index HTML, there's a bunch of images that I need to request. When the server sends the request for those images, it actually also sends the referrer header saying, like, I'm referring or I'm requesting this image from this page, right? The server then aggregates all this information over time and kind of builds a, a, a relationship map to say, like, whenever somebody asks me for index, they also later ask me for the logo and a CSS file and JavaScript file. And then the server can automatically figure out which, which resources to push. Right? This is an example. This is the kind of auto-magic example, if you will. Uh, a more hands-on example would be to grab a low-level server, like, for example, the Node Speedy implementation. And then there, there's an actual API that just says, like, push this resource. Right? So you can have really tight control over which resources you push. Um, another thing to mention is that push is, all, is also not, like, it won't, you need to be very careful how you leverage push. Like, if I already have the logo.png in my cache, I don't need it, right? So uh, we need to figure out an efficient way to figure out which resources to push and when, right? So maybe that's a cookie. Maybe it's some other mechanism. There's, uh, basically, what I'm saying is there's a lot of room for innovation here. Different servers are approaching it from different angles today. You can have a hands-on look. You can have a, a hands-on strategy. You can have an automated strategy and everything in between. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, okay, so do other browsers support, uh, or what do they do if you want to talk speedy and they don't support speedy, right? So speedy negotiation happens during the TLS handshake, right? So if your client doesn't support it, it'll just uh, fall back to HTTP 1 without any extra penalty. So basically what happens is uh, when we first send the TLS handshake, we also advertise the fact, or the client advertises the fact that it supports speedy. And then the server can opt in to, to use Speedy or not, right? So if the client is not aware of it, it just wouldn't advertise it to the server, and the server would say, great, I got to fall back and use this. Which is why, for example, the Nginx and Apache modules work transparently, right? You just drop them in, and the server itself determines, like, for this client, for this Chrome client, I'll use Speedy. For this IE client, I'll have to use HTTP 1.1 in the meantime. So that's, that's the nice thing about it. The speedy benefit restful services. Uh, can you elaborate on that a little bit more? Um, so let's see. So that's more of an application concern, right? Uh, so it should make it more efficient. Uh, so uh, actually, one example I'll give you is it turns out that most HTTP requests have a high overhead. I if you omit the cookie data, an average HTTP request adds about 800 bytes of metadata. Right? So let's say you want to send a tiny little JSON payload that says hello world, like message hello world, you know, 16 bytes of data. On top of that, we'll wrap it in a nice package of 800 bytes of HTTP metadata. Things like here's the user agent string, here is the refer header, here is the whatever, you know, everything else. So there's a lot of overhead associated with that. With HTTP2, we actually have header compression, which is to say all of the metadata will be compressed, so uh, much fewer bytes uh, transferred. So that's one example. Uh, you can you can have multiple requests going over the same connection, but otherwise, you know, this is effectively transparent to you. Yep. Uh, sorry, is, are you asking about Speedy on Android WebView? So the answer is no. Uh, so the, the, the question was, does Android WebView support Speedy? And the answer today is no. Uh, if you look at the Chrome uh, repository, uh, we're working on a new project, which is the Chrome View, right, which is a Chrome-powered Android Web View, if you will. That will support Speedy. Uh, but it's still in the early stages, experimental stages. But something you can check out. Uh, sorry. I'm not sure. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm not sure what the limits are on WebView. So most browsers, mobile and desktop, have this limit of six connections uh, for HTTP 1. Um, and that's, that's kind of an empirical number that we arrived at. Uh, one of the reasons for this is some routers are not very well designed, let me put it that way, and they start dropping, randomly dropping connections after we send too many requests. So uh, all the browsers kind of you know, pick the lowest common denominator, unfortunately, which is six. Um, and actually, uh, this is kind of a, f a fun fact. Uh, in Chrome 27, which is the latest release, uh, just shipped last week, uh, we actually changed our uh, domain, or we changed our connection logic to say, yes, you can have six connections, but we will only download 10 images at once, no matter how many connections, because we found that through our testing, uh, that a lot of sites were abusing domain sharding. They were trying to download way too many images, and those images would basically saturate your bandwidth and not allow us to download the JavaScript and HTML and other things fast enough, such that by basically imposing this limit of 10 image requests, we were able to get faster rendering performance, which is kind of counterintuitive. Uh, but what it means is that if you're sharding images today across n domains, with 10, at most 10 requests, that means uh, you should be using at most two, two separate domains, right? Uh, this is only Chrome today, but you know, we found that this was a, a nice win in terms of visual rendering performance. Yeah. All right, anybody else? Yeah. 
so are we going to uh, are we going to have to change our application servers to support pipelining? Uh, the answer is depends <laughs> on your application server. Uh, most likely, yes, because most of the application servers built today are not built with the assumption that you can use pipelining. So let me clarify that. HTTP 1.1 theoretically supports this uh, pipelining idea. In practice, it just hasn't worked out. It's not really deployed on the web. Uh, so all of our requests are sequential, right? With things like server push and ability to push multiple streams, and we also have this idea of priorities in HTTP2. So you can actually say, when I send a request to your servers, I can say, like, this is a very high priority request. It's a JavaScript file. You know, I just sent you five image requests. D don't worry about those. Like, I just discovered a JavaScript file, which is like, I need this yesterday, right? Uh, with priorities, your server can now look at this and also prioritize how it processes those requests. Right? So there's, once again, there's a lot of, I think, interesting innovation that will have to happen on the server side. Uh, we're shifting a lot of the hacks and workarounds from the browser. So if, uh, I'll give you an example today. A lot of the browsers today uh, play funny games with uh, sending requests. So let's say we're parsing an HTML file, and there's 80 resources on it. Right? But we can only have six requests going at once. We discover a bunch of images at the top of the file. Should we send those immediately? Well, we don't know, right? Because if there's a JavaScript file later, which is actually blocking your rendering, then maybe we're better off waiting until we discover it. But we don't know because we haven't parsed that far. So what should we do? Well, uh, we, can, we can start playing ga games, right? We often actually, even though we have the resource, we defer it and say, like, I'm going to wait because I'm not sure. Uh, and that creates additional latency. With HTTP2, we can just get rid of all of that logic and just send everything at once to the server. But this means that the server needs to be much smarter now. Right? It can't just say, like, here are all the bytes that you asked for. Because right? that could be a large JPEG, which yeah, is not helping the user. And it looks like we have about seven minutes before the break. So this is actually probably a good place to break. So if you guys want, we can uh, ask a few more questions, and then we'll continue after the break. Yay, nay? I'll take that as a yes. <laughs> Uh, sorry, can you can you try that again? So using push, right? Yes. Yeah. So the way push works is you send me an index HTML or a request, right? I send you the response for index HTML, and I also send you the associated resources. And each one of those resources is just as if you made an HTTP request. It goes directly in your cache, such that later when the browser asks for it, it just pulls it directly out of the cache. So you can all the same logic applies. You can have cache control headers. You can, you can have many other things. Uh, in fact, you know, kind of a, a fun, uh, not really explored area right now uh, is something like, well, if I can push your resources, that also means I can invalidate things in your cache. All right? This is kind of a crazy hack optimization, which is to say, let's say I told you to cache my application JavaScript code for a year. All right? Now it's sitting in your cache, but now I have an update. All right? Well, with, regularly today, right, uh, there's no way to invalidate that. With push, I could actually like, create a fake request and send you like, uh, a response to a fake validation request to say, invalidate this. Right? Uh, it, I'm not sure if that's actually supported by the browsers, but it's supported by the spec. Right? So I think HTTP2 will open a lot of interesting innovation here. Like the implementations in Nginx and Apache today are fairly simple. Right? Like we, we are getting the basics right of like here's how the framing works, here's how all these bits are laid out on the wire. But these more advanced use cases is something that we're playing with. Um, it is cross-browser. Let me see if I can pull this up here. Let's see if the Wi-Fi gods are with us. 
speaking of unreliable performance. Uh, where are you? Here you go. So IE9 Plus, Firefox, Chrome, Android. So the notable omission today is iOS and Safari. Um, I hope they implement it soon. So this, this is an official standard now, a W3C standard. So uh, there's great adoption for it. Yeah. And I've personally opened, I think, three bugs on the Safari tracker to say, hey, we're going to get nap timing. And the response is, closing as a duplicate of blah. And I can't look at blah, so I can't, I can't tell you. So, but hopefully soon. So what is the best way to implement real-time delivery, like notifications on mobile? Uh, so that's a fun question. Uh, it's, it's hard. Uh, so what you don't want to do is, so first of all, real-time means many different, has many different meanings for different people, right? Uh, sometimes that literally means like I have a notification and I need to deliver it within you know, X number of milliseconds. That's kind of the SLA for my application. For others, it means like I just need to send a notification within a minute, right? So uh, what you don't want to do is, unless you absolutely have to, you don't want to be waking up the radio by just pushing spurious updates, right? Uh, if you if you have some ability to batch updates, that's the best way to do it. So for example, uh, let's say your application is emitting update events every, I don't know, 20 seconds, right? There's a lot of activity going on, but the user doesn't actually need to have an update every 20 seconds. You can batch those and deliver them every two minutes or every one minute. Or you can look at the battery life on the device and say like, hey, this, you know, the battery is really, really low and the user will probably appreciate if I started you know, sending these updates less frequently. Uh, so it requires a, li a little bit more logic. Uh, if you look at services like um, Google Cloud Messaging, so all of the platforms, so iOS, Android, have services which allow you to do efficient push. And the way this works is, for example, Google Cloud Messaging actually knows when your device is on. Right? It, so it can be smart. You, you push your message to the Google server. Right? It, it buffers it. And then you can set a flag on it and say, uh, the specific flag is actually delay while idle which means that if the device is idle, don't wake him up. Like, this is a, you know, this is a cool notification about you know, the, the latest uh, whatever, you know, NBA scores. But this user doesn't really care that much. Like, when they turn on the phone, get it down to them, but don't wake up their radio. And the Google server is smart enough to do that for you. Uh, you can also set things like time to live in a message to say, like, uh, well, I sent you the score, but if the user doesn't check in within 60 minutes, that's old news, so just drop it on the floor. Like, we don't need it anymore, right? So it's a combination of these types of services that you can use to do really efficient push. And then if you can't use a service like that, then you can just build smarter application logic to say, uh, you know, can I batch this request? Can I have adaptive intervals? And then uh, even deciding on which is the best strategy is kind of an interesting question. So sometimes it may be actually more efficient to pull for updates. Right? Because there's a lot of coordination costs between, like, should I batch this or should I not? Uh, let's say you have a lot of updates coming, once again, every 20 seconds. Right? It may be just simply more efficient for the, ser for the client to pull the server once every two minutes instead of having an end-to-end connection. But effectively, uh, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how much data you send, one byte, one megabyte, you will wake up the radio, and the radio will be on for about 10 seconds. This is, I guess, uh, one thing that I didn't have in the slides. But whenever you turn on the radio, uh, the radio is on for about 10 seconds. It doesn't matter if it's one byte or one megabyte. So if you're going to transfer data, transfer as much of it as you can, and then turn off the radio. Like, don't, don't, trickle, me, tr don't trickle the bytes by saying, like, here's a preview of this image. And 10 seconds later, here's a preview of the next image. Uh, that's actually an anti-pattern. And Actually, let me go back and I'll show you guys. I'll, I'll share the link to the slides, and there's a lot of uh, links embedded uh, at the bottom. If you're interested in specifically mobile, um, so I gave a talk at Google I.O. Uh, last week uh, specifically about mobile performance uh, from radio up, which is to say, how does Wi-Fi work, how does 3G and 4G work, and what are the, some specific strategies that you can use to optimize uh, your application for battery performance and also just latency uh, and other constraints. So uh, you can check that out later.